Welcome to the start of a wonderful OKD deployment marathon. Um, we've got a number of folks from the uh, OKD, which is the OpenShift's uh, community distribution of Red Hat, uh, Red Hat's um, OpenShift, and we are going to try today to demo on as many platforms as we can coerce our members into doing so all day long. Um, if you don't know OKD, um, you can pop over to the OKD.io um, website and read all about it. Um, we've been working diligently on it and have recently just done our GA release for um, OKD4. And it is out there in the wild and that's what we're going to be demoing today. So um, to kick us off, um, we decided to start with AWS and um, the cheapest AWS cluster possible and a full AWS deployment to follow on that by um, and Christian Glombeck, who is the co-chair of the uh, working group, is going to um, set us up um, and show, us, show off um, the first bits here. And we're going to drive through today, um, you know, putting a general surgeon's warning on the day. It will be fluid because these demos are live um, and we may sneak in a few more in between things um, if people go short. And we're going to try and do the Q&A during the cluster up while the clusters are booting up um, because there is a lag and there's really not much to see on the screen. So if you're watching. Um, you can ask questions in the chat wherever you are, whether you're um, in one of the live streams or in um, the blue jeans itself. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to let Christian um, take over the screen here and uh, share his screen and walk us through the cheapest AWS deployment we could figure out. So uh, I'm going to share your screen. There we go. Does it work? Okay, perfect. Um, so, can you see? Uh, can you see it? All right. Is it big enough? It is big enough, and I'm gonna take my video off and let you rock and roll. Okay. So, in order to get a minimal install going, um, we really just have to change a few um, few parts of the install config. So, usually, what you do is OpenShift install create install config. Um, I've already prepared that, so I'm not going to run it again. This is where you, you're going to be asked for your essentially your AWS or your account credentials and where you want to install. This is the installer provision infrastructure. Um, instead, I'm going to just show you what um, after the install config YAML is created with that command, uh, you just go ahead and edit it a little bit. So what we're going to do here is um, the number of worker replicas is scaled down to zero, um, and the master replicas are just one now. I've also changed the type um, of the AWS uh, node to uh, M5X large, um, just to be sure we get that. Um, we need quite a bit of RAM still for the install, um, so 12 gigabits for, for installing. And then when it's running, it's going to be six. You could additionally um, also um, put in a, a fewer, a smaller node for worker nodes if you want to scale up worker nodes right now. As we're just going to install the one master cluster right now, this is kind of it. Um, so after the OpenShift install create install config, um, we are going to do OpenShift install create manifest. And after that, we can go ahead. You can um, actually, if you don't want to, if you don't want to edit anything and just take the defaults, it's not going to be the smallest cluster, cheapest one. Um, you would just do this command um, right off the bat. We're, because we've wanted to edit the install config, um, I have to. I had to do them in in sequence here. But create cluster will also, if there's no install config and no manifests present, it'll it'll create them. Um, so OpenShift install create cluster, we can start now. So really what I've done is just scale down the, the replicas, um, to the master node, the control plane nodes to one and no worker nodes at all. 
then I think what I forgot here because I had to change laptops, um, I should have also put the uh, the ingress controller on the master node. Uh, so we're probably not going to have ingress right now. I'm just noticing. Um, so usually you you have to change the label as well for the uh, for the um, ingress controller to run on the usually it runs on the infra nodes, which is scheduled on a on a worker. Um, I should have changed that to master. Anyways, let's see where we where we get here with this. Um, so that's an additional step um, for the ingress controller to change the label to point to master. Um, well, and yeah, now we have to wait a little bit. The install is running. So I think we can go back to this. Dan, is this already the, the time for Q&A now? Um, what someone was asking what the O stands for in OKD, and I think that's um, it's, it's interesting. The O stands for nothing. Um, and when we uh, shifted from Kubernetes to, to, to Kubernetes from the older version of um, OpenShift, uh, which was a Ruby on Rails, MongoDB platform as a service, and we shifted over to being on Kubernetes, we uh, had to rename the project to be more in line with other OKD, uh, other Kubernetes distributions um, and legal marketing and trademark issues um, made us have to use a three letter acronym much like EKS or uh, uh, OK, you know, OCP and other, other acronyms that are out there for Kubernetes distributions. So the O actually doesn't stand for anything, not even origin. I like to joke that it stands for OK, Diane, because everybody agrees with me on that. But um, it took a lot to figure out that acronym, and that's where we have our OKD Panda and everything else. Um, so a technical question for you. Nurla is asking, do we need to generate ignition files for the install? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this. Um, so this is what the installer does for you. Um, in the install, in the second step, I just ran the um, OpenShift install create manifest. It'll generate all the ignition files um, within machine config, uh, Kubernetes objects. But then, uh, if you do, because if you run it step by step, you still have the uh, the opportunity to change those. If you do want to provide your custom um, ignition, then you can you can edit the generated or add to the generated uh, in, uh, ignition config that is uh, output by the create manifest. Um, there is also the question: uh, curious if install could be done with spot instances. Um, yes, I think you can. Um, you can because I didn't because I, I did, don't install any worker nodes right now. If I had changed um, that to to the spot instance type for the for the worker nodes, um, I could later scale up workers that would be spot -ins. So that is possible as well. I'm not sure how, how that would work on a master node, um, to be honest, but it's definitely possible with, with workers. All right, and there was one other one, and this is the question that everybody always asks. Um, were those steps documented anywhere yet? Uh, so we have a draft document right now, and there's a, a bit of documentation floating around as well. Um, this was originally done by Vadim Rutkovs, who, who can't be here today. Um, so I will definitely, together with him, submit a document to the OKD repository, so we'll have that um, properly documented as well. Um, maybe just to note, this is really just for testing purposes. It's not an HA cluster. Um, you won't be able to upgrade easily. Um, because the etcd quorum will not be kept. Um, so, yeah, we'll still uh, document it, but it's not. It's just a testing setup for if, if you want to really do some uh, a cheap test uh, on, on AWS here. Not supported for any workloads, really. And Lee Schwank is asking, um, is there a comparison chart table of the capabilities OKD, OCP, and OKE? And, um, not what is OKE again? It is the OpenShift Kubernetes engine. I think that's what that one is supposed to stand for. Um, and it is another variation of the product that is simply the um, Kubernetes pieces of it. Um, 
that you can get support for and all that. And um, I will look for that on, on the corporate website. Um, I have not seen that and I have not prepared one on that um, side yet um, or been asked to before. So I will see if I can find one that's at least an OCP and OKE and, and share that with the, with the group um, shortly. I think there is an OKE versus OCP one, but I'm not sure about OKD and there shouldn't be too much difference between OCP and OKD except for, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, Fedora Core OS. Yeah, sure. I can, I can do that. So um, that's actually the main difference. I'm not sure what the difference between OCP and OKE here is um, in, in particular, but um, OCP and OKD, um, they're essentially the same cluster code. The only real difference we have is we use Fedora CoreOS instead of RHEL CoreOS as a base operating system. Um, we manage the the operating system updates the same way we do through the cluster. So there is no, it's one life cycle, the cluster and the base operating system. So if you update OKD or OCP, you'll also get a um, an OS update. So the boots will automatic, uh, the, the nodes will automatically uh, pull down the new image, um, lay it onto disk and reboot into that obviously in a safe fashion, one after the other. So if there's any blockers, uh, one node doesn't come up or something, um, the update will fail. But uh, yeah, we have this, um, the Core OS technology, which is um, essentially uh, today a fusion of RPM OS tree and ignition. RPM OS trees are image-based um, operating system, essentially, or the, the creation uh, tool for it. So you, you can compose uh, an operating system image with that, and it's going to be immutable, and you can um, update it. It's, I think Colin Walters, the creator of, uh, of RPM OS, he likes to say it's like a Git for uh, OSs. So you really have a commit hash um, that represents your on-disk state, and then you can upgrade from one to the next uh, atomically. And, um, we do that through the cluster, and in the case of OKD, we do it um, on the base of Fedora CoreOS, which you can also use standalone. So Fedora CoreOS ships Docker and ships Podman engines. So if you just want to run single uh, container, single node uh, workloads in containers, um, then that's the right operating system for you. It's really uh, geared towards running containerized workloads. Yeah, and even Fedora CoreOS and RHEL CoreOS aren't that different. It's just uh, the the package sets they use. One is the Fedora package set, and the other one is the RHEL package set. So it's mostly the same packages, just you know different versions, a different kernel. You get the RHEL kernel in RHEL CoreOS, you get the Fedora kernel in Fedora CoreOS, and yeah, but mostly it's uh, the same tech running there. And um, in about two hours, I think, um, at 1500 UTC, our third demoer will be Dusty Mabe, who is um, sharing the Fedora Core OS um, and helping do the community management for that. And he's going to demo OKD on DigitalOcean. And so you, if you have more questions about Fedora Core OS, we can pepper Dusty at um, 1500 UTC, so in two hours time too. So if you want a deeper dive, then come back and um, join us for that. All right, how is your deployment going? It is running still. So um, the Bootstrap API is up by now. And um, now I can share my screen for a second here, um, if that helps. Um, just to let you see what's going on. Um, and Ashraf, you were asking about Azure. Um, Azure is one of our second to last presentation today. So we will have a demo of deploying on Azure. Um, the only one that we had to cancel was GCP and that was only because Vadim um, wasn't coming and it's not much different than the AWS one. Can you see my screen again? I can indeed. Okay, perfect. So this is what you're going to see when you run uh, the create cluster command. Um, it's just going to take a while. So uh, first we have to wait for the bootstrap node 
the, the Kubernetes API on the bootstrap to come up. And that has happened now, and now we're bootstrapping, and um, that may take up to 40 minutes. Usually it doesn't take that long. But yeah, we're about halfway through, I think. Um, yeah. There you go. Okay, go back and here. There's one more question, and, and these are great questions, everybody, because um, after this, we're going to grab all of the um, questions and turn them into FAQs. So you're helping us um, develop our FAQ for OKD. Um, and one of the questions was, can I convert an OKD cluster to an OCP cluster? Um, so yeah, that's definitely a thing uh, we want to do, and it should already be possible, really, uh, if you force an upgrade to uh, to the OK, OCP um, release. Um, so I've, I've never tried that, but it should be technically possible. We want to actually test that in CI at some point uh, to make that a good story. Um, but yeah, it's, it should work, but um, nobody's tested it so far, I think. I also just uh, pasted a link in the chat, which is our working document here for the cheaper AWS cluster for the one single node. There's also a few more tricks in there, um, like yeah, running the infra on the master node and also uh, setting up spot instances for workers. And the one other thing so, I would, would, would add is if you're interested in this, because as you can see, this is a, a working group um, and we work. Um, if you'd like to join the working group, um, I've just put the link to groupsgoogle.com for the OKD working group, um, or you can go to okd.io and, and find the link there. But um, if you have questions that we don't answer um, or you want to work on maybe a, a migration path from OKD to OCP uh, with us, um, we would love to have you come. Um, Christian, are we actually hosting a call tomorrow? A working group? I, I think so, yeah. I think so. I think so there's a problem tomorrow. Yeah, there is one. I know it's KubeCon week, but um, we did not cancel because um, the work never ends, and we, we'd love you to join and, and, and help out. So um, please feel free to sign up for that mailing list and that group. And that's a good I'll also that. quickly paste the link for the uh, FedoCal, for the Fedora calendar where we have our OKD meeting. So it's Please also join the Google group, but this is uh, this is a calendar you can also uh, subscribe to, and we'll have all of our meetings on there. Um, Frank had another question: Do you need a pull secret uh, to OK to deploy OKD? No, you don't. You do need a fake pull secret, though. Um, you can um, read that in the OKD README um, here, and it's really just an a JSON struct with with like a fake application in it, um, because we're still using we're very close to the to the cluster code um, to, to the OCP code also in the installer. The installer is actually the only part right now that isn't exactly upstream, so we've had to fork it a little bit. Um, we're gonna remerge those um, soon, I hope, um, and it's not too different, anyways. But uh, that is one of the things we we didn't want to pull uh, pull out entirely because it's definitely necessary for the OCP product and for OKD we don't really need it but we haven't found a super nice solution to dealing with that so uh, if you don't have a pull secret and don't want to create one um, uh, with Red Hat you can use a fake one and then you won't be reporting telemetry data to Red Hat if you use a Red Hat um, pull secret then you'll be providing telemetry data that that collects it. Which would be awesome because we would love the OKDs to, to have some OKDness show up in, <laughs> in that as well. So um, just personally, I'd love to see that show up on some of that. But it's because one of the things with an open source project, um, there is no gatekeeping on OKD at all. Um, so there, we know there's a ton of deployments out there. There's a lot of interest in it. but um, other than the working group and people asking us questions in either the Slack channel or on um, different tech support things, we don't really know a lot about um, how OKD is used in the wild. And so later I'll share a survey, and if you are using OKD or planning to, I will have you um, fill that survey out, and I'll share that with all the videos as well. 
The other thing someone had asked about um, was the release cycle, uh, the difference between OCP's release cycle and OKD's re um, release cycle. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we don't, um, yeah, we don't adhere to the OCP release cycle um, at all, really. We just um, kind of wait for OCP to become stable to go to the next uh, minor version, like the, the switch from 4.5 to 4.6 uh, we'll be doing at the same time as OCP. We won't be going ahead and using the master before OCP hasn't tested it out enough to say it's stable as well. But we do releases uh, roughly every two weeks from the current stable branch, which is 4.5. Um, and we do that in a way where we do, do that in the alternating weeks uh, in which uh, Fedora CoreOS does its releases. So they do biweekly releases as well. And then we kind of have a one week soak period to see whether the new um, Fedora CoreOS works well and then We'll, uh, one week after that, we'll release the new OKD on, on top of that new Fedora Core OS. So roughly two weeks, it's roughly two weeks for Fedora Core OS, so it's also roughly two weeks for OKD. All right. So this is, and here's one more that's just come in. With a default cluster monitoring in 3.11, there is no way to modify the alert rules within Prometheus. Is this something that will be possible in four point releases? I am not an expert on the monitoring side. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question, unfortunately. I will find someone who can answer that for you, um, Steve. And so if you want to uh, hang out for a little bit, do you know that answer, Charo, by any chance? I can I can venture an uneducated answer. Um, the solution in in the three dot um, was to provision an additional uh, monitoring infrastructure for your applications. The what was provisioned with the cluster was intended to be cluster specific, and so it was it was never meant to be modifiable. In four dot, I believe it's a similar situation, but there's an operator for that, and, and that you can um, you you can provision additional rules with, within the um, the configuration of that operator. Um, I, I know when you stand up a four dot x out of the box, um, you can start creating a, additional alerting rules. I don't know if you can create them for applications or if it's still infrastructure specific. But but there is an operator that that you can deploy that that will enable that. And with that said, I'm prepared to be wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. And Charles is one of our uh, long-standing working group members, and he is a new Red Hatter. So um, welcome welcome to the fold, Charles. Happy yes, to have you. Yes, I'll be here. playing the newbie card for at least a month, maybe two. Okay. Maybe two. I'll let you get away with two, except you've been deploying OpenShift for a long time, so I'm not sure you can do that much. <laughs> so, so, and we, we're, he's actually gotten um, Open OKD running with Che, so if we get some spare cycles today, I may make him demo that you know, as well, so watch out for that. So let's see, Pepin is asking... There's a GitHub issue he's referring to in the chat. Um, yeah, oh. so I think that is just the fake pull, requ uh, yeah, pull secret um, that you can use. It's the you, you essentially need a, a a JSON with the offs uh, field and then uh, just anything in it, like at least one called fake here. It could be any name, and then another with field with an auth field in it and then anything in there. Um, it's not going to be checked. You can call it fake news or something. Uh, I'll be fine. So how is your um, cluster up going? So it's still running. It hasn't reported back to me. It still says waiting up to 40 minutes for bootstrapping to complete. So as soon as that changes, um, I will definitely let you know. Okay. So 
Well, we'll, we'll fill the time. And this is going to be the interesting thing the whole day is because basically I, I told everybody to try and do live deployments. And so filling that time while we're waiting for OpenShift and OKD to, to do their thing um, will be interesting. So if you have more questions, please do ask them. Um, in the interim, um, what we'll probably keep doing is I'll keep asking um, Christian and Charo and unfortunately Vadim uh, has is not available to, um, to play with us today. Um, but there's a lot of other folks on, on the line who will be coming on today with different um, levels of expertise on different platforms. Yeah, there you go. Destroying that. Destroying bootstrap resources. Sharing at screens is, is what we Which here again to uh, put on the sound. Um, so, yeah, it's... Um, that usually happens when it's successful. So let's see whether we will have something soon. Um, to look into here. So perhaps um, you can tell us a little bit, maybe, Christian, what you're working on now um, for the next release of, um, of OKD. Um, oh, yeah, sure. So uh, for the next release of OKD, we will really have uh, essentially we will converge much closer to, to OCP or even closer to OCP. Right now, um, we still have two repositories forked in the, well, one in, in the payload you're running for 4.5. With, um, with the next version, 4.6, OCP will have moved to Ignition Spec 3. And OKD has been using Ignition Spec 3 um, for its entire time. So we really, we're really closing a gap here. Uh, with the machine config operator and also on the on the installer side, um, so we'll be much closer to to the actual product essentially. Um, OKD has been using uh, Ignition Spec three all the time, as I said, and um, for OCP we were using um, Spec two, and the migration um, had turned out a little bit finicky, so so uh, that took its time. But now we're finally able to to just move everything to spec three. So yeah, th that's gonna be good. Um, and it's also gonna be less of an effort to maintain, I think, and that's introduced quite a few bugs we've seen in the past that we, because we didn't have this rigorous, the rigorosity of checking on our forks is just not that big. Um, but yeah, with that moving to be essentially the exactly the same code, um, we're not going to have a problem there on the machine config operator side. And then I think we, we, we're not going to be able to merge the installers in the next version, but hopefully the one after that. Um, and another thing we're going to focus on is really bringing all the operators from, from the operator hub and all the operators that are supported on Red Hat, um, on, on OCP, uh, bring a community version of those uh, into OKD. Um, not by default, of course, but kind of have them in a operator hub catalog and have them installable um, on demand. Yeah, that, I think that'll be the next big community effort um, that we've been talking about in the working group meetings, uh, is to review those, prioritize them, and start working, pecking away at that list of things. So um, there's a couple other questions coming in, and I know everybody keeps asking me for a comparison matrix between OKD, OCP, and OKE, and yes, we will get one somewhere. Um, I think I saw one for OCP versus OKE, so I'm just repeating myself from earlier, and um, I will uh, endeavor to see if I can pull that one out of um, somewhere in corporate marketing, but I haven't done one um, comparing OKD yet, and I'll, I'll get that on that. Um, James is asking a question, which is probably going to get asked a lot today, is what's causing the slowdown in the, um, and what could be done to make the deployment faster? Yeah, so that is a big issue. Um, and because we're installing uh, quite a lot, so it's not, OpenShift is not a minimal cluster per se. We have a lot of operators, um, just a lot of resources we apply to the cluster that you know help manage itself essentially, um, which makes it so stable. But it's also kind of big because of that. Um, and just there is some uh, 
So yeah, this seems to be a problem right now with the. Well, it may it may still it, it may actually still come up. Um, it's gonna try for some time now to to grab the API. So yeah, um, we're working on that. It's a long-term goal uh, within all of OpenShift, not just OKD, also the product. Um, yeah, but because we have the demand of really being secure and um, having a big feature set by default, uh, yeah, it's not really super close by now to uh, to minimize that footprint. It's a long-term thing, um, and that is yeah, that is I think what I can say to that. You know, there's one question, and, and I don't really know the answer to it um, uh, personally. Um, how and when does Red Hat Engineering use OKD versus OCP in non-production or production and, and right now? I mean, you're on the Red Hat Engineering team. Is there any OKD use inside there other than testing? Um, so I don't think we run any services on OKD right now. Um, we do have something planned in collaboration with uh, with the Fedora community to have a cluster there. Mm, I mean, internally at Red Hat, there is, uh, we have our SRE team that manages our own clusters and, uh, and the customer clusters that are managed. And those are all OCP. So I'm, yeah, I don't think we, we have that uh, right now. But with the Fedora community, we will have at least one uh, quite big cluster uh, at some point in the future uh, for things to test out. Um, so I myself don't have a lot of ops experience, to be honest. Um, I usually just uh, develop and write the code. Um, and then we have this great CI system that uh, really tests out everything. Um, but yeah. Um, I think if there's, and especially with the uh, with the plan to test these OKD to OCP upgrades, kind of um, upgrading into a subscription, um, we will maybe see more OKD usage uh, within Red Hat as well. Well, Paris is asking um, the question that everybody ever asks, as well as um, what is the status of OKD ready containers? Um, and maybe uh, Char that was kind of um, the inference with Charo's Che demo. Um, but maybe Charo, if you've got some insights. Um. It's the it's the question was specific to um, code ready containers, effectively for OKD, sort of the the minimal single node cluster that you you just download and run. Um, I know there is work progressing toward that, um, but I don't know what the current state of it is. I, I actually, um, I haven't looked in a while, um, but I, I know the um, Praveen, one of the, the leads on code ready containers, was actually working on something so that the same thing would work with um, OKD. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get a status out of Praveen, but um, what we've sort of the workaround is, has been this simple single cluster installs and um, some of the, the work that hopefully we'll get uh, uh, some time for Charo to talk about using Che with, um, with OKD. So let's see, um, we're gonna- Yeah, I think just to add to that real quick, I think we, we've had a, um, a proof of concept uh, for a code ready containers on the base of OKD. Um, it's just not, I, I don't think it's really been decided by the team that actually does that to deliver that continuously. Um, maybe we should push on that a little bit as well. Um, but because it it is not that different, especially if you run it um, on a laptop, um, I, I know why people, I can see why people would want it, uh, but for the CRC team, which has limited resources, I think um, it may be difficult to deliver on that right now. Um, even though, yeah, I think we should still follow on, up on that. It's not really a thing that exists right now. There has been one one testing release, but it's not um, like they do that for all our releases. Yeah. Hmm. We also have a proof of concept for, for actually upgrading a single node cluster as well, which has been one of the limitations that if you, if you download and run CRC, um, it, it effectively has a limited life uh, and you need to pull another image of it. Um, but 
hopefully we'll we'll be getting some progress on on those things in the future so that it feels more like the the mini shift experience that that people were probably used to but going back to the previous point about the enterprise class uh, of OpenShift, uh, we, we need to strip it down a, a bit more to get it to a mini shift like state. It, it comes with a lot of enterprise features that, that were left out of mini shift. Yeah. We do know that's a holy grail. Um, so. And they are all part of OKD, by the way, those features. We don't strip out anything for OKD. So um, Mike Rochefort is asking uh, if the CRC life stem stems from the CERT renewals? And hi, Mike. I think it stems from the fact that you cannot upgrade the single node cluster. Oh. So it'll, you'll just have an outdated version at some point and you can't migrate to the next version with the, with the way CRC is right now. to see what other questions there might be here. Seeing any coming in. Mike also says he remembers early on a new image being pushed about every 30 days. For, is that for CRC? I think we, yeah, for people to continue to use it, yeah. So yeah, I think CRC tries to get one release out per OCP release right now. Um, and they obviously don't do uh, as many releases as we do. Um, so, yeah, having all of OKD's releases also done as CRC may be a little too much for that team. I don't think it's too big. Um, but, yeah, we, we should definitely get to a point where we can just get side-by-side -side releases of CRC. <laughs> based on OKD and uh, OCP. Right. All right, checking back in on that deployment. Is it going any faster now? Do we need to buy you new hardware? Um, yeah, well, it's it's not running on my laptop, right? It's uh, I'm just polling the API here, but it's not up yet. Um, so yeah, let's hope um, let's hope it'll it'll come up. Time. Still have around twenty minutes for it to finish, I guess, uh, or even more. It said wait up to forty minutes. So after that, it'll it'll just cancel the thing. Uh, but yeah. So Mike is asking sort of what the purpose is of of today, um, and it, whether or not it's just a day long prep for KubeCon, um, and it's. We normally we do an OpenShift Commons gathering the day before KubeCon, and because KubeCon changed its date so many times virtually, I decided that I wasn't going to try and keep up with them and, and scheduling. And um, and because OKD did a GA release, um, then uh, we will uh, we decided that we were going to celebrate by forcing everybody on the working group to do a demo of their favorite platforms or whatever they had access to hardware or clouds to do for a day long thing. Um, one, to capture some of the, um, the videos and, and ha the how to bits of it for um, our, our website and for our, our YouTube playlists, but also um, really to, to give a little bit more, build a little bit more awareness um, of OKD out there in the universe. Um, it's not the most well known Kubernetes distribution at the moment, but hopefully we'll get there. Um, though OpenShift is pretty damn popular um, these days. So, um, and someone's asking, um, you should have used a more powerful AWS flavor. Um, it would not have been cheap, you're right. Um, but that is going to be the, um, the next demo, um, which Christian's gonna do, which is gonna go over again, um, which is why the whole day we say is very fluid. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we can actually, I mean, it's not going to be that different because uh, the only thing I'll just leave out the editing of the install config, but other than that, it's really the same. Um, so maybe maybe we can maybe we can drop it. I don't know. Um, I can do it again, of course, but we'll have another uh, half an hour wait period. 
let's let's get through the cheapest and then maybe with the AWS uh, one you can just leave that running and we'll come back to it sometime after Charo starts but um, and that will be a good way to to segue into what Charo is going to do next that sounds great so we'll get one done the cheapest and uh, that way because in the working group we tend to have the open source folks who don't have the biggest budgets and um, or or the most permission to use their hardware. But I think the, the goal is to give someone um, a lots of alternatives and ways of doing things. Let's see, how about if you share your screen one more time and let's see where you're at. So it's still just polling the API to see whether it comes up. Um, It'll do that for up to 40 minutes, um, or actually 30 minutes in, at this stage. Um, and this is, yeah, it, it has bootstrapped and now it's just waiting for for the one control plane node we have uh, to come up. Um, that'll do a few few reboots because it'll pull down the current, uh, or the, the Fedora Core OS version uh, we've referenced here um, in our payload and pivot into, it's called pivoting uh, with uh, the way we do it. It's the RPM OS tree image will be, or the RPS, RPM OS tree commit will be uh, delivered to the cluster, to the node in a container. And then we have a binary, the machine config daemon, which has a command pivot, and that'll unpack that RPM OS tree commit from the container, put it onto disk and reboot into it. And this is, uh, yeah, this can take a little while. Um, so we have, yeah, I, I don't think we've, we're, yeah, although we're getting close to the 30 minutes now, um, but yeah, it, soon it'll either say it failed or timed out, then it'll roll, then it'll destroy the, the resources here, or it'll say success and give me, give me the domain to log into. So unfortunately, not a lot to see while this is going on. Uh, it'll just, it's just trying to, yeah, get onto, onto the API. So in terms of faster deployments, uh, how does this compare to like a vanilla Kubernetes? Like how, have, have you tried? I'm just curious here because I know um, there's a lot of extras in OpenShift. Somewhere. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's only one time thing, the install, right? Um, when you scale up nodes um, after that, um, that is much quicker, but our rollout, our initial install does take, does take longer than, than just the vanilla Kubernetes. Um, I think, yeah, that may be up in, in about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes and we're, you know, taking half an hour, 40 minutes for it. So we do have a lot of, uh, you know, space to for improvement here. That is, that, and it's definitely a thing our customers uh, for the product also want. Uh, it's just because it's only, you know, once at the very beginning, uh, it is not that super important, but obviously it, it is a little bit annoying, especially if you do presentations like this, um, waiting that long. And yeah, we're on it. And, 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 you know, Mike you, uh, is making a great suggestion. The installer needs to be more exciting and engaging. And I think someone should take up the challenge of doing an ASCII version of the Panda and inserting it into the installer somewhere. That, I think, would be, that, that'll be the next one. Some ASCII art in there. Yeah. And we're here. Patience pays off. So yeah. And let's see how this turns out. <laughs> Drum roll. So it is it is uh, an HTTPS encrypted connection, but it is self signed, so you'll have to accept this risk and continue. And ta-da, here we are.
So this is our one node, minimal cluster, and yes, cluster has overcommitted CPU resource requests for pod and cannot tolerate node failure. May have chosen a an instance type a little bit too small. Um, although yeah, it came up. Pretty happy this worked. Nice. So yeah, we have one node as you can see. It's everything, it's master and worker at the same time. So you'll schedule your workloads on that as well. You probably won't be able to schedule a lot as it's already running. Uh, yeah, running full a little bit, but um, yeah. So can, can you, while, while we're here for a second, um, and just for a second, go, go into the operators and show which operators are running in this minimal configuration. So yeah, and we don't have any operators really uh, installed from the operator hub, I think. Okay, yeah, we do have one, which is the operator lifecycle manager, which is actually the operator that manages the other operators from the operator hub. Um, so we, we only install core operators, but even the core operators bring quite a big set of functionality here. Um, I think in the future, the way we will uh, minimize this is uh, to split out a few of, a few more of those operators into operators on, on the operator hub, so they can kind of be installed on demand, but they aren't necessarily always included. Um, yeah, on the operator hub, um, these are the operators you can um, click and install. Not all of them are tested yet, or actually not many of them are tested yet, but this is kind of the next big endeavor of the working group, of the OKD working group to, to ensure we have a broad set of operators here in the operator hub that run on OKD and are tested on OKD regularly. And there's two more questions um, coming in, and, but I get to press the easy button easy. There we go. That was our first demo. It ran and you got into OKD. Well done. A um, couple more questions, um, but well, if you want to destroy that and um, bring up, set up your other one, um, now that we've done that, the, the full one. Um, Frank is yes. asking, is there a link from which I can download the CA bundle for this cluster to import it into my browser? The CA bundle for this cluster. Um, so I, I'm, I don't understand, uh, to be honest. Yeah, that. So you, I, ah, right. You well. So you don't have to click the um, the accept uh, the risk and continue one. So um, you could use a CA that is signed by by an authority that is accepted by the browsers, and then you wouldn't have um, that problem. As this is a self-signed one, um, you, yeah, you just have to trust it yourself. Um, there, there is documentation about that um, in, the, in the OKD and o OCP docs. So I will quickly stop sharing um, and set up my full environment here. We could actually, um, yeah, the what he's looking for is probably that might be under the um, uh, on, in, in the generated files from the installer might be somewhere under there he could actually use to import into his browser but yeah yeah I guess that is probably um, the case that you have to change something in your install config or in the generated manifests. So this time, um, really, I, I'm just running a one command here, OpenShift install create cluster right away. There's no install config um, prepared here. So it's going to generate, it's going to include the two commands that I just ran separately, the create install config and create manifests. It'll do all that for you. So you just have to put in your SSH public key, uh, the platform you want to install, um, the region, 
then you'll get a base domain that is um, your your AWS account owns that essentially. Um, and then you have to choose a cluster name. Let's uh, just try OKD full. Um, do that. Now I have to go copy the, do we still have it in the chat, the fake auths thing? Let me try that. Here we go. Nice. Oh, did this not work? I may have copied the space or something. Yeah, probably. Oh, no, actually, it is running. Okay, perfect. Um, so, yeah. And that's uh, essentially all you have to do to start that install process. Right now? Okay, there you go. Perfect. And now we um, are at the same point again, where we just have to wait, and uh, we have time now to answer questions again. All right. So why don't we do that? Um, and Charo, I know you're up next with the bare metal, um, which always sounds to me like a heavy metal band kind of deployment. Um, and I saw the guitars behind you, so I, it might be appropriate. If we pause uh, now and let the AWS lives thing go um, and let Charo queue up um, for his um, deployment and share his screen. So All thanks right. very much there, uh, Christian, for uh, hanging out with us. And I hope you can spend some more time today because I'm sure we'll be repeating some of these questions. Yeah, sure. I'll be here. I'll be here. Cool. Thanks. All right, do you see a whole bunch of open terminal windows? I do, and I see yes. a sm smiling face, and I'm gonna turn my smiling face off. Why don't you introduce yourself and what you're gonna demo now? Okay, uh, I'm Charo Groover. Uh, I am a new uh, architect for uh, Red Hat Services uh, here in the Southeast United States. You have reached the Horizon Audio Conferencing System. Uh -oh. Tone, enter your conference security code, followed by the pound sign. Let me find out who that is. Pause for a second, everyone, and we'll figure out who is doing something odd here with sound. It's like it's uh, near lip. Near lip. Yes. Yeah, it's near here. I'm looking for him, and I'm just muting him. There you go. All right, so start that again. All right, carrying on. <laughs> well, like, like Diane has said a couple of times, these are live demos, so um, we're fully expecting a, a, a Bill Gates moment. Um, it might not be a blue screen, but we might see a stack trace of death uh, and all kinds of other interruptions. But I'm Chara Groover. Uh, I, like I said, I, I've been with Red Hat for, for one week, um, but I've been a consumer of Red Hat products, both upstream and um, subscription-based uh, for most of my 20-year uh, career in IT. So this is kind of the, the dream job that I never knew I always wanted. Uh, and today what I'm going to demonstrate for you guys is a deployment of a bare metal uh, Kubernetes cluster using OKD. Um, this is going to be simulated bare metal in that I'm actually using libvirt to, to run the machines uh, so that, one, so that you guys can actually see what's going on, right? Because it, it'd be hard to get you console views to bare metal machines uh, in, in this current configuration. Um, this is a user provision infrastructure deployment, so the installer is not going to be provisioning the machines for us. These machines are already provisioned. If you see in this terminal right here, I've given you sort of a verse list view of the machines that are currently provisioned. You can see we've got a bootstrap node that is not running. We've got three master nodes 
and we will have three worker nodes. And throughout this install, uh, I'm going to guide you through the process of deploying the cluster, first through the bootstrap process, and then we're going to add the three worker nodes to that cluster. Now, I'm using Virtual BMC, which is a tool that comes uh, out of the OpenStack world uh, to simulate the IPMI management of these virtual bare metal machines. And these machines are going to boot uh, into iPixie and using the MAC address of the machine as it boots, it's going to pull the appropriate uh, iPixie boot configuration file that sets its kernel parameters, sets the Fedora Core OS install uh, URL, and the ignition file that it's going to use to, to start from. Uh, I'm using fixed IPs for this particular lab setup, so everything is already provisioned in DNS. And I'm using a, a Fedora Core OS tool called FCCT to manipulate the ignition config files to inject the IP configuration into each of the hosts. Um, I've got all of this written up uh, in, in a, um, a little tutorial that, that I've got out in my GitHub page, which we can provide a link to. But without further ado, we'll go ahead and fire this thing up. So the first thing I'm going to do over here in the left terminal is I'm going to power on the bootstrap node. And then I'm going to attach to its console. And what we're going to watch here, it's going to do an iPixie boot. The, it, it's a chained boot, so it first pulls um, it just a boot.ipixie file is what's being served up by the, the DHCP server for it to pull from TFTP. That then chains it to look for a file that is named after its MAC address. It pulls that file. You see it got its um, kernel and its initial RAM disk. The kernel parameters that were passed to it um, gave it its instructions for installing Fedora Core OS. And you can see right now it's actually pulling um, that FCOS image across. Now we've got an HA proxy uh, load balancer. Um, it's this guy right here, OKD4 LB01, that is already running and is um, configured to um, sit in front of this new cluster as it comes up. This will take a little bit um, with the scrolling logs. It's pull, like I said, it's pulling down the image. Um, one other thing I'll point out um, while we're waiting for the bootstrap node to, to complete its install is that we're also doing a mirrored install today, um, which hopefully makes this go a little bit faster than pulling all of the images across the wire. What I have is a local instance of a Sonotype Nexus that I have mirrored all of the images into, if you can see this eye chart. And so the install is actually going to pull its images from the Sonotype Nexus. Right now I've got Quay.io in a DNS sinkhole so that uh, it, can't, it can't resolve. And because it can't resolve, it's going to assume it's um, an air-gapped installation and it will pull from the, the configured mirror image. All right, Fedora Core OS is booting now. It's going to overlay the RPM OS tree. And when it finishes, it will boot one more time and it will start the bootstrap. Which we will watch right here. Okay, 
So it just finished the, the OS tree overlay, and now it's coming back up. When it completes booting, should begin the bootstrap. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and fire up the master nodes. So I'm just running a little um, script here that's going to do an IPMI tool command against those three master nodes and start them up. And the fans on my little Intel Nooks just lit up hot. <laughs> Okay, and in the top right corner here, um, I'm going to run the OpenShift install command and direct it to monitor the bootstrap process. And if you, uh, if you do this at home and you monitor the logs like this, don't be alarmed by these failed, failed, failed um, entries that you see coming out in the logs. This this is the bootstrap process waiting for its resources to go live. And so it will continue to loop uh, until the various resources come up. And you can see the API just uh, came up. So, so our API is now live and we're waiting for the bootstrap process to complete. Down here in the bottom right hand corner, we're just um, tailing the journal control uh, logs of the bootstrap process itself. This, this all in takes about 10 minutes from the, the bootstrap node firing up to the bootstrap process itself completing. The um, the installation itself will complete after about another 25 minutes. So we've we've got some time now to um, take some questions if folks want. Yeah, James Casal is asking um, from Twitch: um, Is the sinkhole necessary to use Mirror? I think it still is. Um, I, I know it has been for a while that if you don't create the sinkhole and it can resolve the external um, host, it will pull the images from the from Quay.io. And that, that's why I, that's why I created the sinkhole to, to simulate a disconnected install where where I'm behind. Um, bunch of firewalls and proxies that, that prevent my nodes from having direct internet access. Let's see. A couple of questions just to double check. Um, the link to the documentation on this, is this the same as the stuff that you did in the OKD4 UPI lab setup? Yes, yes. There's a there's a new branch um, called iPixy that uh, when we're done today, um, I've got a little more cleanup on the documentation to do, but I'm going to merge that branch into master. Um, the the old um, tutorial that was the CentOS 7 based one, I've branched master to a CentOS 7 branch. So anybody that's still running CentOS 7 would want to use the CentOS 7 branch. Uh, I've upgraded my entire lab to CentOS 8 and have enabled um, iPixy even for the for the hardware for the bare metal itself. So that so that just by creating a um, an iPixy boot file with the MAC address of you know a new piece of metal, um, all I have to do is plug it into the network, click the power button, and it will provision itself with whatever personality I want it to have. Okay. I'm just checking the other feeds here. Okay. 
the other feeds are, are a nanosecond behind us, so uh, in blue jeans, so trying to be there. And Brian Jacob Hepworth is saying that he really likes the Fedora Core OS news and seeing that. Kudos. So is this going to take us another 20 minutes or 30 minutes here? Uh, it, well, as soon as the bootstrap completes, then we'll be about 23 minutes out from completion. Okay. Um, the bootstrap usually takes about 10 minutes in this environment. Okay, book. I'm going to do another pitch for people to join the um, OKD working group while we are waiting here, um, because that's what I'm I'm charged with is getting more folks in. So if you're liking what you're seeing here or if there's features missing um, or other platforms that we should be demoing to or testing on um, or that you're using OKD on or wishing to do so, um, please join the OKD working group. Um, the mailing list is here. Um, I just put it in the, the chat and um, it is in open Google group. And we have a lot of uh, meetings. Every we, we meet bi-weekly, um, and we have a meeting tomorrow. And I'll throw the Fedora for OS and uh, a chef. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we will um, do the Azure one that you requested earlier. Um, that is our second to last demo, I think. Today is Azure. Uh, for the Fedora calendar link here. All right, the bootstrap is getting close. Okay, it um, bootstrap has succeeded. Now it's going to wait just a little bit longer to send the event, and then you'll see, okay, there it went. So the bootstrap is now done. Um, you can see in the middle terminal that we do have three master nodes that are live. Um, I'm going to now remove the bootstrap node. And I'm going to take it out of the HA proxy configuration as well so that we will forget everything that we know about the bootstrap name. Now we'll watch the install complete. All right, so we are working towards 4.5.0 OKD. Awesome sauce. Now, the, this is something odd about um, this install monitor here. It will say 42% complete. Um, here in a minute, it may barf a couple of errors as um, some of the resources restart. Um, and it will also reset the clock. So it, it's, um, it, it plays with you a little bit. You'll get up to 74% complete, and then all of a sudden you'll see 12% complete, and then it will quickly wind its way back up. Um, I, I'm making a bold assumption here that that is actually the result of it monitoring some of the resources that through this process update themselves. And so that percentage of complete becomes a little bit variable. So if you, if you see that um, running this at home, don't, don't be alarmed. It, it is actually um, working towards completion and you need to be patient because from this point, it does take about another 23 minutes. Twenty-three minutes. Well, you want to talk a little bit while you're doing this about um, the work you're doing around Che. Um, sh sure. Well, actually, it wasn't. It turned out not to be much work at all. Uh, and, and in fact, if if we end up with enough time, um, I can I can deploy a um, hyperconverged Ceph instance into this cluster to give us a storage provisioner, because that that's really I think I think the folks that might have struggled with getting um, Eclipse Che up and running is that it does need persistent volumes um, both for um, Postgres. The, the, it deploys an instance of, of Postgres to support an, an instance of Keycloak that provides um, the identity provisioning identity management for your Eclipse Che environment. 
but the workspaces themselves also require um, persistent volumes. Uh, you can probably make it work with ephemeral volumes, just understanding that if those pods ever got evicted, um, you lose everything, which would be significantly detrimental to your um, Postgres instance. So, so it does require that you have some kind of a um, persistent storage provisioner. Um, I have done it in the past um, in older um, 3.11 clusters with iSCSI, but now with, with the Ceph operator, us using the Rook operator to deploy Ceph, um, it's much, much easier. And something else I'll, I'll mention here, um, I'll run this again. So you, you see we've got three master nodes that are running, but they're also designated as worker nodes. Um, that's an artifact of how we're provisioning here because the install config that we used um, does not designate any worker nodes. Um, so the installer by default makes the masters schedulable. Um, when the installation is complete, that's something that, that we're going we're gonna to change. We're, we'll add the three worker nodes, and then we will make the um, masters unschedulable. Right. Fr Fernando is asking, is it possible to specify a different ignition version during the .ing, or .gn, I'm going to say that wrong again, dot ignition files creation? I don't think so. I believe the install. Well, it, it's it's not possible. Yeah, we're stuck with one. You should at at this at this time you should always be using ignition version three point one point zero for everything. Slight correction, ignition spec version three point one point zero. I was about to say I'm pretty sure there's more than that. The ignition versions don't match the spec version at all. Yeah, it's Ignition v2.x with spec v3.x, and our current spec config spec version is 3.1.0. So for the Ignition config, always use the spec version 3.1 at this time. We should probably just bump the Ignition versions just to make this a lot less confusing. <laughs> yeah. Because there's no particular reason not to, as far as I'm aware. Just going to introduce that new voice is Neil Gompa from Datto is in the house. So welcome. Hi. Back. Yes. Yeah. I just sort of forgot that I hadn't actually been uh, um, introduced. So I'll just. Oh yeah, I can't. Uh, why is it saying the camera isn't used by some? Whatever. Anyway, the microphone works. Figure out why the camera doesn't in a, li in a little bit. Um, uh, I'm I'm a DevOps engineer at Datto. I'm here as an OKD working group member, and I'm going to be assisting Dusty in a little bit once we. Once he, he and I get to our part of this OKD deployment fun, uh, where I will just talk randomly uh, while while Dusty pushes buttons and stuff. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So here I'll I'll walk you through a, a few of the things that that were prepared ahead of time. I, I said a lot of words to describe it. Um, one of the, especially the the way I'm I'm doing this with with um, fixed IP addresses. Uh, one of the things that you have to provision are DNS uh, records, a few key DNS records. Um, you can see I've got um, in here the provisioning for uh, a, several different clusters that I run. Um, but this is this is the one that we're presently looking at right here. So each of the um, master nodes, worker nodes, and the etcd nodes uh, requires an A record. Um, the the master and the etcd obviously are sharing the same node, so so they're going to have A records with the with the same. Um, IP address. You also need um, three server records for the um, etcd, and then you need a pointer record for reverse lookup for each of the of the physical nodes. So your masters and your worker nodes, you'll need pointer records for those. But the as you can see, the DNS setup is not onerous, um, but it is necessary.
and here I'll show you what um, I'm using an open WRT router um, it's actually a travel router to um, actually provide my DHCP and IPIXI capabilities so the the boot.ipixi as you can see is very simple um, I'm echoing some information just to make sure the right host booted uh, and then chaining in an IPIXI file that is literally named after the MAC address with hyphens replacing the colons. And here's one of them right here that I believe will be one of the worker nodes. And so this right here um, gives it the kernel parameters necessary to boot, tells it, yes, we want to install core OS, tells it where to install core OS, tells it where to get core OS, and tells it um, which ignition file to use. And that's really the secret sauce there. Not very secret. Yes. <laughs> you just kind of told the whole world. I did. I know. It's all right. I've already published it in my GitHub. So. <laughs> all right. We are, in theory, at 84% complete. Um, I expect it to reset the clock at least once while it's while it's doing this. But this is how the... do you determine this percentages? Because like I don't see anything on screen that would tell you percentages. Oh, right here. Can you see the the? Oh, the... okay. There it is. Okay. It helps when you highlighted it. There's a lot of word soup on screen. It, yes, there is. Uh, and th this is how I keep the install from being boring: is give you lots of um, journal control and logs to look at. Because <laughs> otherwise, there's not a lot to look at. No, no. So how did you come up with this setup for, I mean, you're doing the bare metal, right? So yes. how'd, you, yes. how'd you come up with it? Oh, gosh. Because, <laughs> like, I, re I remember that, that bare metal is, like, the least splashed out deployment method of them all. So... The fact that you came up with something is impressive all on its own, so that's worth the story, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I back in at the end of 2017, um, I got addicted to the Intel Nook um, machines, and you know those little form factor boxes are are, are they're, they're not they're not cheap comparatively, but considering the amount of compute that you can pack into one of them. Um, for a for a home lab setup, they they are pretty affordable, uh, and if you buy the right chipset, um, you can put 64 gigabytes of RAM in one of those little suckers. So you know you get one with a Core i7, um, the newest ones, the the tenth generation, they've got um, six CPUs. Um, so you've got 12 um, vCPUs available and 64 gig of RAM. You, you can run quite a bit on them, and, and my idea was actually get an OpenShift cluster running on the, the NUCs. Um, and then I stumbled across this thing called nested uh, virtualization with Libvirt, and um, while I don't do OpenStack, I had a curiosity about it, and that's how I came across um, virtual BMC. And, and so decided to basically bump it up a level and um, use libvirt virtual machines with virtual BMC to simulate uh, bare metal. And then it was just sort of, a, I want to make this work. So I powered through making it work to get um, bare metal install of OKD uh, up and running. Um, Submitted a few tickets to the Fedora Core OS team that they were very, very, very gracious to help out. Um, somebody that didn't know what they were doing. Um, I, I had never, you know, touched uh, Core OS before, so so that was quite a bit of a learning experience. And thanks for being part of the community. 
Yeah, yeah, Dusty and those guys were, they were incredibly helpful. Um, and so it's it's kind of evolved um, from from that point. The the latest iteration of it now uses the, the FCCT tool to inject um, some customization into the machines. Um, actually, while we're while we're still waiting for that, oh, there, hey, quick here, here's the reset I was talking about. See how we went back to zero percent complete. Don't panic. Um, I don't know why it resets the clock like this. Maybe somebody in engineering um, could tell us, but it is still progressing. I assure you. That is very confusing and kind of frightening. Uh, actually, it looks like it resets after it downloads an update, so it probably loses all of its state when it does that. Yeah, that that that's my suspicion because it does go through several um, iterations of updating some operators. Yeah, so it's just probably losing its state every time that happens, which is unfortunate, and I'm not sure that makes sense, but the best I got. It still works, though. And that's what's yes. important. That's the important part. So don't freak out when it goes from 80 to 90 to zero. Yeah. So right here, if you guys can, if I don't know if this is readable, but but you can get to it on my GitHub page. So so this. Could is you zoom structure. it up just a little bit? Just zoom it up one level. So there we go. Is, then it's readable. Yeah, this is a shell script um, that that I wrote that actually does the the provisioning of the of the quote unquote bare metal for me. Uh, and right, right here, um, this is a YAML file that gets created where it's injecting the um, customizations that I want each of the machines to have. So in this case, um, what I'm doing is I'm creating a um, basically a rename of the primary NIC. Um, to Nick zero so that it doesn't come up as some funky ENP blah 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 blah. Um, I want it. I want it to be more than predictable. I want it to be predictable and known. And so I'm using the MAC address of the machine to explicitly name that network interconnect device as Nick zero. Uh, and that way, I, I always know what it's going to be and where it's going to be. And then I inject into that its um, specific configuration. So I'm setting, you know, its its name server, its domain, its IP address with the net mask and a uh, gateway. And then I'm also injecting its host name so that it persists its host name. And there's a bunch of other stuff that the that the script does, which um, is one thing I, I am going to do. I'm going to add um, better comments into this so that if any of you are are looking at how this thing is working, um, you'll understand what each of these sections is doing. All right, we're back up to 84% complete. At this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and fire up the worker nodes. It is safe to do so now. Actually, I could have done it a while back, but I'm going to go ahead and do it now. So I'm sending each of them an IPMI command, um, given a 10 second pause in, in between each one, just so they don't um, slam my poor little travel router with um, DHCP and file pull requests at the same time. And we'll go ahead and watch one of those guys boot up. So there's one of the workers. It's going to do the, the same thing that you guys saw the bootstrap node doing. Um, it's pulling the, the core OS image right now. And then it's going to go through the same process, uh, except that it will retrieve its ignition file. Once it, once it processes the initial ignition, overlays the, the OS tree, and starts um, its process to join the cluster, it's going to get its, ign uh, its ignition file from the cluster that will give it the personality of a worker node. 
And if you watch the left hand side of the screen um, closely, you, you should see it hit a point where it's um, waiting on and then you'll see it very quickly pull that ignition config and at that point it will start to join the cluster. Oh, there it was right there, the, the start job. And there it go, it got its ignition. And so now it is booting up, it's going to ask to be a worker node. So just to give you a quick update on the AWS cluster, it's still waiting for the cluster API to come up. Um, I do have to leave now for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, I'll be back after that and I hope my cluster will be up by then. And so see you in a little bit. All right, see, see you in a bit, Christian. Our cluster is up. And you see awesome. it, gave us, it gave us our initial password. So let's go ahead and log in and prove to the world, hopefully, that this little guy is alive. All right, and as before, um, self-signed certs. So, and whatever OS and browser you're using, you are going to have to accept those certs. It's okay. Self-signed certs are fine. All right. Now, it creates a um, temporary cluster administrator for you. And that it dumps that password at the end of the install process that you can use to um, gain access to your cluster. And there we are. Now, there will still be some operator updating things going on, and your control plane um, will still be settling out. Um, but at this point, we have a live cluster. Ooh. If you will indulge me for a few minutes, um, we'll go ahead and finish adding the worker nodes. And then we'll do a couple of housekeeping things on our cluster. So you see we've got some pending. Um, certificate signing request. Um, that is also an artifact of the way we're doing this um, user provision infrastructure install, is that it's not automatically going to approve those certs because it doesn't necessarily trust anybody that wants to join the cluster. So I'm going to approve those certs. And there should be another batch of three that are gonna come up pending. Um, Yep, and so now we have three worker nodes. They're not ready yet. They're still completing their own personal bootstrap. And that'll take a Another minute or two for them to come live. And I'm going to do a couple of house cleaning things here. One is um, I'm going to remove the samples operator uh, because it, um, unless something has changed recently, unfortunately Christian isn't um, here, we can ask him later. Um, the samples operator, because you don't have an official Red Hat secret at this point, um, it won't be fully functional and can, in fact, impede um, updates to your cluster. So I yank it out, um, not using it anyway, at least at this point. Uh, I'm also going to create a ephemeral storage uh, for the uh, image registry because it will also be in a removed state because it doesn't have a persistent volume. So um, patching its configuration with an empty dir specification for a persistent volume. And I'm gonna create an image pruner to run at midnight every night because the, the console will gripe at you um, if you don't have an image pruner configured until you do. So anything older than 60 minutes, it's going to prune at midnight every night. 
or 60 days, rather. 60 minutes would be um, 60 aggressive. Minutes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, you, I, I don't know what kind of storage you have, but 60 minutes might be appropriate if you basically only have enough for the cluster itself to run. And there we are. We have Ooh, a yay. cluster. Okay. Now, huge caveat. Ooh. Our our masters are still schedulable. Our workers are schedulable. But that's not bad. Well, it's not, but there is a gotcha in here, which of course I never tripped over. Um your ingress pods will deploy on a schedulable node. Well, if um, your load balancer is only configured to look at certain nodes, um, here you see I've got my um, the port 80 and port 443 and port 6443. They're all directed to the master nodes. Well, if those ingress pods got evicted and rescheduled themselves on a, a node that is not in your load balancer configuration, then you will lose access to your cluster. Important safety tip. So, so the key the key here is either to span your load balancer, which I don't really want to do because that's a lot of extra cruft in the the load balancer configuration or designate some infrastructure nodes. And that's the path that, that I chose to take. So what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm going to designate my master nodes to also be infrastructure nodes. What Why doesn't it do that by the vault? Um, well, be, because the, 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 the best practice is to create a couple of worker nodes that you set aside as infrastructure nodes. Why? I don't know. Good. Okay. <laughs> Just making so, sure. Because, yes. like, I've seen these recommendations listed in the documentation, but there doesn't seem to be any particular reasoning to back them up. Like, historically yeah. speaking, I've seen clusters typically do the masters as infra nodes because that way they handle essentially the stuff that keeps the cluster itself running and the worker nodes are free to uh, work on um, developer user workloads. Yeah, I think one of the things you need to consider is how how beefy uh, you make your master nodes. You know, if you've got heavy, heavy, heavy ingress operations, um, you know, given everything else that the master nodes are doing, um, that that might be a little overwhelming for them. In, in my particular lab environment, um, the, the the master nodes are heavyweight enough. E each of them has 30 gig of RAM and um, six vCPUs. So so I feel pretty confident um, designating them as infra nodes. So what you do once you once you run this label on them, then you need to patch the scheduler so that the master nodes are no longer schedulable. You'll see right now they are infra, master, and worker nodes. When I run this, now they're just infra and master nodes. Now at this point, nothing got evicted off of them. So if you wanna boot things off of them that you don't want running on there anymore, um, you, you do need to either go through and evict all the pods that are running on each of those nodes manually or reboot your master nodes, uh, which is a bit more of an aggressive way of doing it. Now I'm gonna patch the ingress operator to tell it that it's okay for it to run on those master nodes. And if you can read the eye chart here, I'll, I'll explain what it's doing. It's setting a node placement policy, um, giving it a match label of infra, node it's also that's not enough you also have to set some tolerations because the master node is now tainted um, so so you need to give it a toleration that it's okay for it to run with a node that has a taint of no schedule and a taint of master node and so now that that is done you will see the ingress operator Uh, one of them is terminating. There's a new one running that is not in a ready state yet. 
As soon as this one is in a running state, the second one will begin terminating. Don't panic that your other one sits in a pending state for a while because it has an anti-affinity rule that it won't run on a node that already has an ingress pod running on it. So it has to wait for one of those terminating pods to complete terminating before it will schedule on the master node. Wow. And so there you go. Now we've got one running, we've got one pending, and we've got two terminating. And it, it will remain in that state until one of the terminating pods completes terminating, and then the anti-affinity rule can be satisfied, and the, the pending pod will also deploy. And, and these take a while to terminate because they're shutting load. That they're they're gracefully shutting down. Okay, there you go. So one of them is done terminating. We now have two running uh, ingress pods. Um, one of them is in a ready state. One of them is still bootstrapping. And the last thing I'm going to do is get rid of that Cubit admin account because its password is sitting there in plain text in your installation folder. So I'm Oh, so it does get written down to this somewhere. It, I was going to I was going to ask, are you just do you have to make sure you you save that output text or will it actually be somewhere where you can get to it? Yeah, if you if you look at the the directory that you used for the installation so there's, um, you know, there's the boot, the the ignition files that it um, created, and the metadata. It creates an auth directory, um, and in that auth directory, it creates an initial cubic config, which you can load to give you access um, to your cluster directly from your command line, and it um, dumps that plain text password right there. But if you get rid of the cube admin user, doesn't everything that like links to the cube admin user break? It's a temporary account. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I, I created an HT password file uh, ahead of time. My tutorial um, has instructions for how to do that. Um, so, so I've got an admin user and a dev user with passwords already in there. Um, you saw me just create a secret right here. So I apply, I created a secret in the OpenShift config namespace um, called HT password secret from that file. And now I'm going to um, apply a custom resource. That I've already, here let me, um, So this is the custom resource that we're going to apply. Um, it's setting up an HT password identity provider, and it's going to link it um, to that secret um, that we just created, the HT password secret. So I will apply that. Uh, it complains that I used apply instead of create, but uh, I'm just in a habit of using apply um, to update objects so you can ignore that that complaint there and then the last thing I need to do is this admin user that I, I just set up a secret for but doesn't exist I'm going to give him cluster admin rights and now I'm going to be brave and I'm going to delete well it also says the admin user doesn't exist that, that's correct um, but it creates it in the background what yeah that's not intuitive. No. Or obvious. But it does, and it works. Okay. And so there we go. I just logged in with my new, somewhat more secure cluster admin account.
and you can see our four green checkboxes. We've got a happy cluster. Um, it will complain about alerts until you like set up a Slack channel or something to send your alerts to. Um, it's actually pretty easy to do. You create a receiver and walk through it. Um, but I have used up most of my allotted time, so I'll stop playing now and see if I think anything. the playing is fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to give you that. That was easy button. <laughs> All right, well played. And um, can you do one more thing for me, just because um, I think people keep asking me these questions. Go back to the console and show uh, the operators that are installed in your installation. Sure, I will do that. All right, so you go to operators, operator hub. Um, Are there no operators found? Because operators don't exist. They install no. those. I think no, it, you know, it may still be it may still be updating. Oh. Um, well, the operator hub operator might not actually be up yet. Yeah, because it does it does take a while after you know that that initial install took us another twenty three minutes. It does take things a, a while to settle down. Um, let me let me show you what it does look like because I have another cluster that I um, stood up this morning. Um, it seems less healthy. Uh, yeah, I think I I think I did something to upset it. Um, but here's the here are the operators that are available. Quite a few. You can see there's if you want code ready workspaces the the upstream of it. Um, Eclipse Che is in here. Do you have enough time to try and install the Eclipse Che one? Um, I might, especially if you don't mind going a couple minutes over, because the first thing I need to do is um, deploy. Oh, actually, no, I can, because I've already got, let, let me make sure I've got um, Steph deployed in this cluster. Um, so we're going to go to the Rook Seth namespace. Yes. Yes, we cool. do. The yes. fact that the Rook Steph namespace kind of indicates you have it set up. Well, it doesn't. Not it doesn't. Fairly. It shouldn't exist if you don't have it. No, it it, it can exist, and I haven't completed the install yet. But well, okay, well. there's that. All right. So we'll go back to the operator hub, and we'll find the Eclipse Che operator. And yeah, it's a community operator. If I call Red Hat, they're not going to help me with it. Um, but if I go on the Slack channel, they're usually nice enough. Okay, and unless you want to do something different about it, you install. And we're going to keep the stable. Um, it is going to uh, create the Eclipse Che namespace. And we're going to let it have an automatic strategy for um, its approval. If you switch that to manual, then when the installer installs, you, you have to go to the installer and then say, yes, you can actually install. That seems painful. Well, if you think about it, you know, I'm doing everything as a cluster administrator. Um, so if you're not a cluster administrator, but you, you know, you want to request something, um, that's part of what, what we've got going on here, because there's all kinds of configurable RBAC um, capabilities within this thing. So when you install this operator as, an, as a cluster admin, does that mean that anybody who logs in with an account can then instantiate it afterwards? A absolutely. Yes, a absolutely. The workspaces, people will be able to get in and create um, workspaces. Again, um, you know, it, it's got lots of role-based role uh, access control so that, so that you can control who can do what. Uh, but yes, anybody that you've got um, created an account in, in this cluster should be able to log into Che, uh, create an account in Che, which will uh, provision them into the Keycloak instance that it's going to create, and then they can create a workspace. So let me switch this real quick to the workloads. Okay, our operator is running, it is alive. 
So we should be able to provision a CHE cluster. And you see what I did from the, from the operator. Here's the installed operators, the provided APIs. Um, that's what I clicked on to get to this view here that I can now create a CHE cluster. Um, it's going to name it Eclipse CHE unless I tell it to do something else. Lots of things you can configure in here. I'm going to take the defaults on everything uh, except storage. And this is what I was mentioning earlier that I believe um, has probably hung some people up is um, Postgres is going to need a, a PVC. And then any workspace that you provision is also going to need a PVC which almost requires that you have a dynamic storage provisioner for this to work. So I am going to give it the name of the storage class. And actually, I'm going to cancel out of this, go down here to storage, show you that we do, in fact, have a storage class. It's a block provisioner as part of Ceph. And when we create our cluster, I'm going to tell it to use that for Postgres. And I'm going to tell it to use that for the uh, workspaces. Uh, also note, each workspace is going to get a gigabyte of provision storage. That may or may not be enough, depending on the type of development that you're doing. Um, that's pretty minimal. So you, you might want to crank that up to five or 10 gigabytes, depending on you know how, how big the artifacts that are going to be built and the code base and you know everything about the development environments that, that you're going to be working with. So I'll create create on that, switch back to the pod view. And you can see it's provisioning um, Postgres. Hopefully our storage provisioner is working. And we do in fact have a Postgres data that is bound. So our storage provisioner is working. Okay, Postgres is running, not ready. So it's still, it's still deploying itself. And this will take this takes a couple of minutes and then Keycloak is going to provision itself um, after Postgres is done. So now Keycloak is provisioning and Keycloak actually goes through a couple of phases. It, it has an, an init phase um, that it that it runs through. So you'll see that pod come up and then terminate and, and be replaced by another Keycloak pod that will be your your final configuration. And you won't see the, the CHE controller um, come up until both Postgres and Keycloak have completed their provisioning. And about how long does that take? Diane has to ask. Um, it, not terribly long, a um, couple of minutes. Okay, cool. It feels like a long time when you're staring at the screen. That's all right. I have plenty of coffee today. And um, Michael has just pointed out um, maybe there, you still have Quay.io blocked via DNS. And that uh, I, oh, you know what? I, I, I don't. That was a good point out. I snuck that in while Neil was talking. Um, I, right here, I blasted a command to my um, DNS server to remove the sinkholes for um, Quay.io and for um, registry.service.ci.openshift.org. I did actually notice, which is why I didn't repeat the question that he was saying, because uh, I figured on screen it was obvious that you got rid of your Quay.io block. No, I, I slipped that in and, and didn't mention it. Well, now it... All right, so we've got um, Keycloak is is bootstrapping itself now, uh, so you'll see you'll see some activity go there. All right, and there it is. So now you see another Keycloak instance um, provisioning, 
and it will take over from the the first one here in a minute. As we all wait with bated breath. In other news, uh, Christian says that his full-blown AWS cluster has finished installation. So when we're done, we'll pop over and let him prove that. And then right. we'll, we'll, we'll grab Dusty when he's back and we'll hit up the digital ocean stuff. Okay, the hook is running. Any of you who are joining us for the DigitalOcean um, demo, we'll probably get started on that one a few minutes after the hour. Um, we're running pretty close to on time, which I think is amazing. Indeed. And we'll, we'll probably lose that thread at some point, but hey. And quick plug for my favorite Java framework. Quarkus, there we go. There's the Quarkus ad, thank you. And, and, and what does that have to do with this? Once your cluster is up and running, you got to run something in it, right? <laughs> oh, so you're going to make something with Quarkus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Built so, that so, mad programming skills. Yeah, yes, indeed. So so the, the first key cloak instance, you see it terminating now, so it's getting itself out of the way. The plugin registry is fired up. Now you see other activity. There's our Che um, controller right here that is creating. We've got a dev file registry. We've got a plugin registry. And as soon as this guy becomes ready, I wish you could hear the fans on my little nooks. I wish I had a fan here. The temperature is popping up here in uh, Canada on the West Coast. It's probably going to hit 32 today. So. Uh, all right. So all of the resources are up. They are all in a ready state. We've had no restarts, which is always a good sign. Um, although occasionally a, a restart is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if we click over here to the routes, um, we have a route for Che, and if I'm brave and open that, okay. Now, self-signed cert again. So, what you have to do at this point is grab that cert. Uh, I'm going to create a, a folder here um, for you guys so you don't have to see all the cruft on my screen. Uh, I'm going to go here and show the certificate. This is Safari specific, uh, obviously. Um, so follow the instructions for your favorite browser. Safari is not my favorite, but here it is. Um, grab that, um, and then what you're going to do is once you've got that certificate, you need to add it to the trust store of your operating system. So in my case, I'm going to go into Keychain, and I'm going to drop that certificate into Keychain, and I'm going to make it trusted. I'm going to do that for you guys here real quick. I'm going to uh, drop it into my search system default search. You see there's there's an old one from a previous install. Uh, I'm going to take the one that we just downloaded and I'm going to replace. Okay. Now I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to say, always trust. 
Now it's going to make me um, certify that I am me one more time. Now, ta da! Woo. And I'm going to say, yet yeah, allow these permissions. And now it's going to um, it's going to ask you to create an account. Now, another important safety tip: if you do what I did, there is an admin account that Che creates. Well, I named my cluster administrator admin, so I need to give this um, a different name, or I will cause some pain for myself. And there we go. Let's che up, running, ready for your code. Woo! Awesome. That is awesome sauce. Thank you very much for that. That that makes my day. This is awesome. Yay! Thank you. Yeah, I think you've just made the entire Eclipse Che community happy too. So well done. <laughs>